Any so, questions on the homework? I was not going to go over the homework, no. Oh, okay. Never mind. Yeah. It's not due till Thursday. I might be willing to answer a question or two tomorrow, but probably not today. So let's first start with um, just putting some up here. I think that I think you guys need to kind of just have a few points of reference. Imagine that this is the the earth and you are standing, say, on the equator. And the earth itself is, of course, spinning, say, this way. So we are looking top down on the earth. And that's you. You probably want me to actually make it so that's something you can see. So like that. Yay. And um, there. That way I'm the most important thing that you see. A little bit more invisibility. So here we go. The uh, the thing I want to start out with this problem and in, in really stating to you is that I want to talk about the difference between rotation and revolution. Because RPM could be revolutions per minute or rotations per minute. There's really not a huge hard and fast rule about this, but the earth is rotating. You are revolving. You're not rotating. Rotating suggests that you're not changing location. Revolution means you are going around something. So the earth revolves around the sun, but it rotates in place. The moon revolves around the earth. So when we want to use these two words, it's probably better if we talk about them as defining things differently. If you're traveling in a circular path, you are revolving. If your axis of rotation is staying in the same place, you're rotating. Now, RPM is an angular velocity. We use the Greek letter omega for angular velocity. Generally, angular velocity can be measured in a number of different ways, but they all come down to just different units. It all means the same thing. So rotations per minute and radians per second is really just the difference between meters per second and feet per hour. It's just different units that represent the same idea. What is important is that a person standing on the edge of the earth has a tangential velocity that is related to the rotational speed of the earth. That is important. And that is something I want you to know. It'll be a huge part of second semester, but it's something that you should have been able to bring into class at the beginning of the year. So for those who didn't or don't have this, this bit of knowledge, your tangential velocity is proportional to the rotational velocity times the radius. That's how they're related. And all of you probably knew this, at least to some extent, because you know that circumference equals two pi times the radius. Because all of our descriptive variables end up being some rotational amount times the radius. So if I want displacement, the linear displacement of an object, it is the angular displacement times the radius. Divide them all by time, and I get the linear velocity is the angular velocity times the radius. Divide them all by time again, and the angular acceleration and the linear acceleration are also related in the same way. So angular displacement, delta theta, angular speed, omega, angular acceleration, alpha. However, to use this, these all have to be in radians or else they are not useful. So in order to put this to good use, I'd like you to find the normal force 
on a 100 kilogram person standing on the equator. So we did in six period. It was kind of fun. Well, probably fun is not the word you would use to describe this, but I am indifferent to your plight. The thing I want to remind you is that in order to stand on the equator, you must have a set of balanced forces. I'm sorry, a set of unbalanced forces. There's going to be a force towards the center of the earth, probably your weight, but there's going to be a force away from the center of the earth, probably the normal force. We've been assuming these things are balanced, but they shouldn't be at the equator because you're traveling in a circular path. And because of that, you must have an unbalanced force in order for you to stay in circular motion. So I would expect a normal force at the equator to be slightly less than your weight in order to accommodate for the fact that you're traveling in a circle. Now, to get to the answer here, we're probably gonna have to use some of the stuff we just talked about. And most notably, you're gonna have to know the rotational speed and radius of the earth. Tell you what, you guys tell me the rotational speed and I'll tell you the radius. Somebody tell me the rotational speed of the Earth. Yes, sir. What? No, I think it's one rotation every 24 hours. I'm going to start there. You might be quoting something else related to its rotational speed. But when it comes to the Earth, that's its rotational speed. It's actually not 24 hours, but that's what we're gonna to have to work with. It's close enough. So um, I'll give everybody in class and at home a moment to put that in radians per second, because I am sure everybody knows how to do that. So sure, I think I could pick a volunteer to tell me the answer. So we're about to see how well you remember things like unit multipliers. So if you don't know how to do this, I did put a couple of unit multipliers up there. You know, things like there's 3,600 seconds in an hour. There's two pi radians in a rotation. If you don't know how to do these things, your guidance counselor is downstairs. They might be happy to find a more hospitable location for you. All right, Avery in the back. What's the rotational speed of the earth in radians per second? Times 10 to the negative what? I don't know. Sounds good, really small. Seems not unreasonable to me. Is we good with this one? Interestingly enough, if you're interested in where minutes and seconds came from, you should look at how 360 degrees can be divided up into minutes and seconds and why latitude and longitude are broken up in minutes and seconds as well. It's kind of interesting. I don't find it interesting. Now, we could find a centripetal acceleration by doing V squared over R. To get V, of course, you would have to use the radius of the Earth. And it is kind of fun to know this number. So. 
I think this is the number to which uh, Matt might have been referring. The radius of the Earth, by the way, just in case uh, it comes up in conversation sometime today, 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meters. The equatorial radius, of course. Actually, this is the mean radius. Which one's bigger, the equatorial radius or the polar radius? Jackson? Equatorial, that's right. Do you know why? That's right, we're spinning. So the inertia of the mass in the middle is pushing the Earth out, flattening the poles. Yeah, that's true. So now that I know that, somebody could tell me the tangential velocity, which is just fun. We should just, everybody should know this number because it's omega times R. So it's at 7.27 times 10 to the negative fifth times 6.37 times 10 to the sixth. So Matt, what you got there? 464 meters per second. That's right. Now, it might be hard to imagine, but if you're standing on the radius of the Earth, right on the equator, that's how fast that point on the edge of the equator is moving. That's not how fast we're moving, but it's how fast you would be moving if you were on the, uh, on the edge of the Earth, right there on the equator. To, to get a, an idea for this, the speed of sound in air is 333 meters per second. Do you understand why I'm giving you a comparison right now? I mean, this is really fast. I mean, if the Earth would have suddenly stopped moving, we would all keep going at that speed. Which way? In this room, if the Earth were to stop going, what side would be covered in people goo? Just point, you have, our school is lined up with north, south, east, and west. Pick a wall and point at it. You guys at home, this doesn't really help you at all. You can pick a wall, it won't make any difference to me. I have no idea how your home is lined up. So you have to, in the chat, put north, south, east, or west. All right, so um, stop for a minute. Just, just north is that way. Sun comes up that way and sets that way. So if the sun is going across the sky this way, that means we're going that way. So if the earth were to suddenly stop and we were to keep going, we would hit the east wall, not the north wall. The east wall. Well, if there's a window there, bye-bye. Because you're going to hit it at 464 meters per second. You're probably going to make it through that window and many more. Although I don't think that wall would hold us either, because at that speed, we are faster than most bullets out of pistols. So, you know, you got to keep that in mind, too. Now, um, Max is saying to, that he thinks that the radius is 6.37 times 10 to the 7th. But no, it's 6.37 million. So that's 10 to the 6th. Pretty sure. Um, and I just looked it up again because you made me second guess myself. Thank you, Max. Appreciate that. Now, this isn't the answer to the question. I do want to go further than this, but yeah, we are moving really fast. This is why we launch rockets close to the equator when we can. It also gave us a huge, a huge advantage over the Russians when we were trying to go to the moon because we were able to make smaller rockets and that actually gave us a huge competitive advantage. They didn't have to carry as much fuel. They had one or two spectacular failures with their larger rockets, which wiped out entire sections of the Cosmodrome. So when we consider you know, the capabilities, the more you can get closer to the equator, the better advantage you have in launching rockets. The, the problem, of course, is that 
for us, you know, we, we launched from the Cape. It's pretty close to the equator. It does a good job of giving us a good, you know, good head start at how fast you want to be going, unless you want to be going in a different direction. So it works great if you want to be going in that direction in your orbit, but if you want to do like a polar orbit or something else, not as, not as helpful. But that's, that's almost always why we launch in the direction we do that. And because it gives you a nice big crash zone, right? Launching out over the water, you launch in the other direction, you know, well, besides that being completely the wrong way to go, you'd be launching out over land. Even the Gulf is just too small for a crash zone. You need a big recovery area. Uh, we could do this to figure out the centripetal acceleration, but I do want to point out that there is an easier way now that we know omega, and that is since omega times r is squared, you could calculate centripetal acceleration by omega squared times r. Just keep that in mind. Just another way to do it. It will be more useful for us to use this second semester because we'll have more revolution and rotation problems. But something to keep in mind, that these are just different ways of considering centripetal acceleration, which by the way, I would like the centripetal acceleration of a human standing on the equator. 60 seconds should be enough time for you to fire that together. So let's get this from somebody at home. Can somebody at home tell me what the centripetal acceleration is? It's small. So if you got a small number, you're doing good. I got 0 0.03 meters per second squared. Zero, yeah, three, four, right? Yeah. That's right. That is the centripetal acceleration as experienced by a person standing on the equator of the earth. Now, that doesn't seem like very much but it's supposed to be zero, right? So when you expect the acceleration that you're experiencing when you're standing someplace to be zero, having a small acceleration is, is perhaps a little unsettling. You probably might not notice, but it does suggest then that mg is going to be greater than the normal force by a small amount. So we used Luke as an example last class period, and he said he was 100 kilograms which makes him a thousand Newtons. But if he was to stand on a scale while, stand, while being at the equator, the scale will not record that he has a thousand Newtons. The scale is gonna record that he's 996.6 Newtons. Doesn't seem like much. You know, about 0.3%, it's a little bit. It's actually measurable. You can measure the difference between your normal force at the equator and at the uh, pole. Now the difference is it's not this different. If, if you went to the pole and stood on a, on a scale, it would not give you a thousand Newtons there either because of something I said and Jackson confirmed for me just a few minutes ago. The radius is different. And part of what causes weight is how far away you are from the center of the earth. So because you are closer to the center of the earth, when you stand at the poles, the force of gravity on you there is stronger than it is at the equator. So there's a little more going on. There's always perhaps a little more going on. All right, so that's a brief reminder of angular velocity and its relationship to linear velocity as it relates to a real problem. Any questions about this? Excellent. That's what I want to hear. All right, look, we did a wide variety of centripetal motion questions. And one of the things that was um, brought up by somebody in a different class was that they're feeling very much kind of concerned with their grade because a lot of the stuff is harder than they expected it to be. Um, I, I, I can't agree or disagree. I don't know that I find it to be harder than I expected it. I think it's exactly as hard as I thought it would be. Newton's laws are, are hard, they're challenging. And it takes a little while until your brain becomes accustomed to understanding how to deal with it. Now, if you had physics last year, it doesn't mean it's gonna be easy this year. If you think back to last year with Newton's laws, it was hard last year too. It doesn't suddenly become easier 
it should become at least more predictable because you have more experiences, but I'm going to expect more of you. What I'm finding is that a lot of students this year are suffering from this desire that things are just click into place quickly, that they'll just expect the answer to be something they've seen before or something they've already done before. I guarantee I have a never ending number of new ways to throw this stuff together. So don't count on it being something you've already seen. Count on having faith that you have a method that works and trust in the method. So we're gonna start leaving the conversation of rotational and I'm sorry, centripetal motion for a while, or at least not to have exclusive ones, but we're gonna take a look at a new kind of topic today. But before I do, I really want you to see this one more example. And it's not a rotational example. It's just helping you understand that this doesn't have to be hard, but it doesn't take much to formulate a new problem that makes it feel like it's completely different. So here's a new problem designed to make it feel like it's completely different. I have a ramp, a frictionless ramp, your favorite kind. And I have a box that I'm gonna put on the frictionless ramp. No big, except now I'm gonna put the frictionless ramp on wheels. That's right. The frictionless ramp is now on wheels. Here's the thing, if the ramp isn't moving, the box would just slide down the ramp. If the ramp were moving at constant velocity, the box would just slide down the ramp. So what I would like to know is what acceleration would I have to give the ramp by pushing on it, say over here, so that the box doesn't slide down the ramp. Let's assume the box has a mass of M and the ramp has an angle of theta, and that's it, I want A. What is the acceleration required of the ramp to keep the box in place on the ramp? Yep. Does it matter if we're doing the or not? Does not, because we're worried about the box, not the ramp. All right, um, you got like four minutes. I'm gonna give you four minutes for this. And that's it, four minutes. You can chat it up if you like, you guys at home. I don't want to wait any longer because what I really want to demonstrate is something that I've been hearing from other students in class for the last like two weeks and it's it's starting to become distressing. I would argue that there's a group of students in this room have no trouble with this and already have the answer which is going to be g tan theta. So if you got it great I'm glad good job way to go. Now I think there's another group of students who they feel like they don't even know where to start. I saw you. I, which is why I had to stop after I walked the room and looked at the papers in the room. I did not look at the people at home. But I did have to stop and say, look, start with a free body diagram. Just start. Pick a place. Trust your steps. Look, we only have like four forces in here, really. Right? We don't use a lot of the ones we have. It's weight, normal, tension, friction. And there's no friction and there's no tension here. So... Is the object experiencing weight? Yes, okay, so we start with the downward arrow. Is the object experiencing a normal force? Yes, it's in contact with a surface. You don't have to say anything more than that. And it's not like you have to do much thinking here. The weight's down, the normal force is at the angle of the ramp. Now, if the box is not sliding down the ramp, it must be accelerating sideways. Correct? It's not going up or down. It's going sideways. So you're instructed to choose a coordinate system aligned with the acceleration as your number one priority. This is my positive X direction. I don't give you a choice. I say, do it. Do it this way. This forces the y-axis to be this way. 
You don't get to choose. Stop thinking you have a choice. Take all off axis forces and find their components. There is one. So it's gonna have a component this way and cosine theta. This has to be theta. Why does it have to be theta? Because if the ramp were flat at an angle of zero degrees, the normal force would have to be straight up. And that also means that this has to be N sine theta. Again, I'm not giving you choices. If the net force in the X direction is MA, then the net force in the Y direction is zero by design. I'm not trying to think about what it means that the box doesn't move with respect to the ramp. I'm not trying to figure out anything. I'm just following my steps because this is how physics works. In the X direction, there is one component of force, N sine theta equals MA. Doesn't give me very much, but that's all I have. In the y direction, by design, net force was zero. So N cosine theta equals mg, period. So I, I have something here. The normal force is equal to mg divided by cosine theta. I know all of those things. I was allowed to use the mass. I was allowed to use g. I was allowed to use the angle. This also tells me that the normal force is bigger than the weight, has to be. Of course it has to be. It has to keep the box from falling to the ground and push it to the side. But if I substitute, I could get the acceleration required to keep the box in place. I eliminated M, the thing I, I didn't know. I wasn't allowed to use that in my answer. Look, you don't necessarily have to know what the answer is going to be ahead of time. And I don't want you to. I want you to have faith that if you follow those rules, <laughs> you don't have to believe in them. This isn't religion. This is physics. It's a set of rules. Step by step by step. It will lead you to something that may lead you to the answer. It may not, it, it might not, but it may lead you to the answer. Yes, sir. No, um, Matt is asking a different question. He's saying if, we were just to be holding this in place. A third party was holding this system in place and we were suddenly let it go. Would the cart shoot off to the left and the box go straight down? Well, no, but this is a third law question. The box is still experiencing that group of forces and there's clearly a component to the right. The difference now is that the cart would be experiencing a force this way, a normal force from the box. It also have a normal force from the ground and its own weight. Clearly there's an unbalanced set of forces to the left. So the cart would go to the left and the box would go to the right and downwards it looks like. Now keep in mind, momentum would have told us that. The cart can't acquire a momentum to the left without an equal and opposite momentum being acquired by the system to the right. But we're not there yet. So no, it would not go straight down. Um, faith in your ideas here. Let's walk, let's go a little further because I, I don't want to do this kind of stuff exclusively. I'm trying to move us towards something new. But I, I was instructed to kind of go with some baby steps. So here's baby steps. I have a pulley suspended from the ceiling. 
on one side of the pulley. is a 60 kilogram person. On the other side of the pulley, a per 80 kilogram person, but they are on the ground. Does it make sense why the one is on the ground and the one is not? If I did not label them 80 and 60 and just ask you which one was the bigger person, would you be able to do that? Tell me which one. Okay, here's my question for you. And again, I'm gonna expect an answer from everybody and you guys at home, same idea. How much normal force is this person experiencing? And while you're doing that, how much does the ceiling have to pull up on the pulley. So I'll ask again, how much normal force is the 80 kilogram person experiencing? And how much does the ceiling have to pull up on the pulley? Um, three minutes, three minutes. You're looking for two numbers. You have three minutes. Free body diagram might be the way to go, maybe. like a little quiet time, hurry. I don't like that noise. That's the noise of Mr. Shelton having a very bad bike ride home today. One and a half minutes left. Thirty seconds left. No cap. All right, you guys at home are going to put two numbers in the chat. First number is the normal force. Second number is the force from the ceiling. I want both of them, just a comma between them in the chat. You guys in the classroom, I'm going to call a table out. Somebody better talk. So you guys at home are first. I'm going to count to 10. And by the time I reach 10, everybody should have put a number in the chat. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Thank you. There's a lot of consistency, folks at home. So let's start here. We're going to start all the way in the back of the classroom. Uh, let's see, with Avery's table. Go ahead. I 
1,200. Next table, Shreya's table. Two and 14, okay, Avery. Two and 14, okay. Maddie. Two and 12, Jackson. And you got what? All right, Steven's table. Two hundred twelve hundred, and Darnell's table. So, two and twelve is the correct answer. Let's talk a little bit about why. But look, I don't want to have to draw anything. I don't have to. The sixty kilogram person weighs how much? Six hundred newtons, which means if they're just hanging there, there are six hundred newtons of tension in the cable. Would we all agree that the 800, the 800 Newton person is holding the cable? So that's not enough to lift them. The ground must provide the extra 200 Newtons. So that plus the 600 from the cable, their net force is zero. Most everybody got 200 and everybody at home got 200. So I feel pretty confident that you got that far. The normal force is 200. The cable has 600 Newtons of force in it. So 600 Newtons here and 600 Newtons here. Several of you think that the ceiling has to apply enough force to lift both people, but it doesn't. The floor is supporting one of the people or at least helping to to balance the force on the pulley, the only thing touching the pulley is the cables and the mount to the roof. So the cables are 1200 Newtons downward. The roof has to pull with 1200 Newtons upwards. Net force is zero. This is not the question I wanted to ask. The question I wanna ask is how fast does this person have to accelerate up the rope in order to lift this person off the ground? That's what I want to ask. The first question was first semester work or first, first year work. This is our question. So take, you only have two minutes and I will single out one of you for this answer. I want the acceleration of the 60 kilogram person. They are going to pull themselves up the rope. That's going to increase the tension of the rope. They're accelerating up the rope. How fast is their acceleration? Oh, and by the way, what does that do to this force from the ceiling? Two things. Two things. One and a half minutes. Acceleration of the person up the rope, force from the ceiling on the apparatus. I want a numerical for both of them. Oh, don't do this to me, Matt. <laughs> 60 more seconds. Got a hurry or the bell will catch us. All right, that's all the time we can offer for this.
All the time we can offer, guys. Anybody want to venture to guess what the acceleration was or no? Go ahead. It is 3.3 meters per second squared. It sure is. How about the force from the ceiling on the pulley? Matt? 1,600. Look, don't think too deeply about this. If I want to lift him up off the floor, I need 800 newtons of force because he has a weight of 800 newtons. That means the upward force on him must be 800 newtons. That's tension. The only way that happens is if this guy applies a force equivalent to 800 newtons of tension into the rope. So now we know where the 1600 comes from, which by the way, is more than the two of their weights combined. Why? Because he's accelerating. The ceiling has to pull up enough, not just to hold them, but to accelerate them. Wait. Net force on this guy is 800 minus 600, which equals 60 times A. Okay, guys, that was fun. I enjoyed that immensely.